which is up to date enough for those people. And one very good person said, well, I asked the students. You know, they know what kind of English is used within their company or between companies, and I use them to uh, keep me up to date. I use them to help me with the vocabulary, because no, no textbook or even digital material is going to be up to date enough for the, the way the business world develops. So, you know, ask your students to help you. Because again, I think, something that's changed is that in the past, the teacher was meant to be the person who knew everything, the fount of all knowledge. You know, you, you even do what I'm doing here. We're on a higher level, and you talk to those people down there. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but the belief was that the teacher knew what was right. I think what has changed, because it's got so much, com so much more complicated, complex, none of us can know what's right. And so there's a much, much more sort of democracy. And the, 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 the dividing lines between what is a teacher, what is a learner, are breaking down. And that's why I go back to my WH questions. You know, in a sense, we're all learners. Even when we're teaching, we're learning all the time from our students. I mean, when I'm teaching, I look, I, I have a great habit of sort of looking at the faces of, of, of people. I'm doing it now. Um, and you, you know from a class which ones are interested, which ones are looking out of the window, which ones are thinking about something nice or nasty that has happened. And as a teacher, you can adapt. I think, to, to that. You look at the body language and so on. And exactly the same thing happened in um, the use of, of service English. Um, what I did to prepare materials for that, I was going to Brazil quite often uh, for something else, and I would extend my uh, visit for a couple of days each time. And I spent a lot of time just observing. I would sit in hotels, restaurants, bars, taxis, just observing, I, I, I felt I couldn't take photos, but I made lots and lots of notes, just observing the communication and observing where the communication failed and where it was successful. And what I, what I realized and thought about myself was that it's not actually the language, it's whether the people communicating feel relaxed and happy with each other. Because what we sometimes forget, I suspect, is that travelling, being a tourist is nice, but it's also quite stressful. I'm sure all of us in this room have had times when, as a tourist or a visitor somewhere, things have gone wrong. And you suddenly think, oh, why do I do this? Why can't I just stay at home and, and, and have a nice time? And other times, everything's wonderful and it, it's really exciting. And it was interesting to see um, where, for example, um, the service personnel, the receptionist in, in a hotel, a Brazilian, would be, would be over-familiar with, let's say, a Japanese visitor. Now, if we say the British are formal, you know, the Japanese are even more formal, um, keep people at, 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 at arm's length. And that was when confusion um, came in. Um, there was also confusion when the travellers were tired. And I use an example of myself for this. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good traveller. I, I, I love travelling. I love visiting different places. And a few years ago, I was going up to the northeast of Brazil for a, a conference, and I had two really bad flights. Um, I, I had my luggage, the luggage had arrived, but I was really tired. And I arrived at a hotel in Recife, I think, at two o'clock in the morning. Okay, hotel, two o'clock in the morning, all you want to do is have a shower and go to bed. Forget about traveling. I went to the receptionist, the reception desk, and there was just one person on duty, um, a, a, a fairly young, young man, and, and I said in Portuguese, I have a reservation here. And he looked at me with a great grin on his face, and he obviously thought, ah, there's a speaker of English, I can practice my English. <laughs> so he said, <laughs> reservation. So I said, yes, reservation. He said, name. I said, Holden, which is my surname. H-O-L-D-E-N. I usually spell it. Um, by the way, I was fascinated, this is going on at the times, I was fascinated as we were coming this morning to be behind a, a, a truck, a, a, a lorry that said John Holden on it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a very common name. Anyway, I felt immediately at home. Um, okay, back to the hotel in PCP. Um, I said, uh, 
an eight-year-old baby, and he went to his computer, no reservation. Two o'clock in the morning, I said yes, and I could hear my voice getting more and more English and kind of determined, and I said, yes, I have a reservation. He said, oh, no, no, no reservation. I thought, oh, my God, am I going to be sleeping on the beach tonight? <laughs> um, and then he said, passport. So I gave him my passport. He opened it, and then he looked at me, did something on his computer, big smile, and he said, ah, Suzanne. <laughs> and what I had forgotten is that in Brazil they use the first name much more as an identifier than the second name. And here's me who've been going to Brazil for 20, 25 years, and I forgot that. And the breakdown in communication was not linguistic, it was cultural. Um, and I, I use that as an example that um, as English is being more, more and more used in an international context, we have to be, we have to be alive to the range of um, cultural stereotypes that each country has, but also the personal ones. Um, we have to realize that if people are stressed, and think of yourselves, and when I'm teaching, I, I ask students to think of their own um, context. You know, think of your own life. Think when you're communicating for something. Think when you go into a shop or store here in Lima, and you're in a hurry, and the blasted assistant is having a a conversation with a friend and won't attend to you. And I suspect, I mean, you're all very nice people, but I suspect you get quite cross. And it probably affects the way you interact in Spanish with, with that person. And exactly the same in an office situation um, where emotion can get in the way. So I think one of the things we, we can help our students to do is try and bring the language of the textbook to life by trying to link it with the real world. Uh, most textbooks have lots of conversations, dialogues, and they may be recorded, they may be on video, you may be able to use them on, on the interactive whiteboard. Uh, but what usually happens, most teachers go straight into the language. Yeah, it's a conversation in a, a shop or a hotel or whatever it might be. And they go into it, maybe they ask the students to listen first. They go into it on a linguistic level. They might, might ask focus questions, or they might listen and then have comprehension questions. But very rarely, from what I've seen, do teachers say to the students, look at the photographs, which usually accompany the dialogue. Look at the people in that, those photos. Who are they? What do, you think, what do you think they think about each other? And one of the ways I've discovered of bringing dialogues to life, conversations to life, is if there are photos, is get the students to look at the photos, get them to speculate about the people, get them to think about who they are, the relationship between them, whether they like each other, whether they hate each other. Um, all that will affect the way they're communicating, and then try and use that, those ideas, in listening to the dialogue and hopefully role play and, and having fun with the dialogue. And one of the problems for all of us as teachers, I think, is that we never have enough time. The, the, one of the, the, the things a lot of us do is, oh my gosh, I've only got you know, another 10 minutes. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how long I've got. That's <laughs> a real question. Um, am I OK? Tell me when to, another five minutes and then we'll, yeah? Okay. Um, one of the things to, to help bring the, um, uh, the, the dialogue to life is to spend time on it, but spend time on it just, not just from a language point of view, and use parallels with the student's own life, their own context, in the classroom context. And I think it will pay off. But the, the sort of push for all of us as teachers to think, I've got to get on, I've got to finish the lesson, I've got to get them uh, towards the exam, and so on. So, 